Now we are on to part two of chapter 15, which covers the evolution of bacteria. At this point, we'll be talking about more specifics in regards to bacteria and their role on planet Earth. This part will cover what we know bacteria most closely or most, most intimately as is uh, their ability to cause disease. Then we'll look uh, at some ecological impacts that uh, humans have been trying to harness bacteria for. Um, this is more of like an engineered perspective as opposed to their natural role, or well, engineering their natural role in the environment. Then we will move out of bacteria, bacteria into the realm of protists, uh, trying to follow the evolutionary way that organisms have developed. So protists are eukaryotic organisms. We'll talk a, a little bit about the endosymbiotic theory, which is amazing. We'll take a brief glimpse at the diversity of protists and another look at how multicellular life perhaps came to be. First off, bacteria and disease. Most bacteria do not cause diseases. Uh, most bacteria that live in the environment have another role. Uh, often it's decomposition or the, like we talked about earlier, to aid digestion in other organisms in a symbiotic relationship, or uh, there are, I'm sure, many roles that bacteria has in the environment, th that bacteria have in the environment that we don't know anything about. Initially, uh, it's best to understand that the term pathogens refers to bacteria that cause disease in either, you know, plants, humans, animals, th fungi, things that we're familiar with. Uh, basically, disease-causing bacteria are pathogens. There are two common pathways that bacteria utilize to perform as pathogens. Uh, the first one you need to know the terminology for is an exotoxin. Now remember, exo is outside of the cell and endo is within. So if you just look at the word, it should be very clear that this is a toxin that the bacteria secretes into its environment outside of the cell, uh, hopefully to induce some response in the environment that'll make it easier for the bacteria to eat and proliferate. Uh, one example that your book gives is the bacterium Staph aureus, and I'm sure you've heard of that before. That is a strain that's notorious for living in hospitals and has become resistant to many, many uh, antibiotics. I think there's, uh, they call it MRSA, uh, multiple, multiply resistant Staph aureus. Uh, so you've got it living on your skin, probably in your nose as well. Uh, so moving on, you also need to know the term endotoxin. So this isn't a toxin that's released into the environment of the bacteria. This is a toxin that is kept within the cell membrane. Uh, to cause disruptions or whatever disease that this bacteria is going to cause. One sam sample that the book gives you that should be familiar to everybody is salmonella. Uh, probably most of us ha have had an experience with salmonella and that is many of the aspects of it are our, our body's response to the endotoxin in the membrane of salmonella. Some of the most interesting diseases and effects that bacteria can have on people uh, or other animals uh, as a result of infection are discussed in your book. Three of the most famous and, in a way, most frightening, I think, um, are listed here. Your book talks about anthrax, and I believe everybody in this class is old enough to remember the anthrax scares uh, when anthrax spores were sent to individuals, uh, government individuals, and uh, many people died. Uh, the part of the anthrax bacteria that was sent is called an endospore, and essentially this is like a spore, although it's not a reproductive unit of the bacterium. It's really an environmentally stable version with the bacterium within it that has uh, entered a dormant stage, and once conditions become favorable again, where it's either 
in the warm, moist mucous membrane of a body, then it will essentially come back to life and uh, do what it does best uh, to cause an infection. And um, I do have some pictures on the next slide. These are very difficult for <laughs> for me to find some that didn't that weren't incredibly disgusting. So uh, well, we'll see how that goes. Your book also talks about the plague and everybody's familiar with the plague. It's Yersinia pestis, that's the name of the bacterium that causes it. It was a plague in human populations, sort of as a result of unsanitary conditions. Uh, basically, the fleas on rats uh, transmitted the plague from these animals to people. There are two different versions. The bubonic plague is when it expresses itself by manifesting in the lymph nodes of an individual, and the lymph nodes are in the groin area, in your armpits, and in your neck. Um, or it can then trans, uh, become pneumonic plague uh, when it's transferred between people in uh, droplets. Once it's in their lungs, it can easily be transferred between individuals. So I know this is a disease that you think of, um, that most people think of as a plague of yesteryear, of a long time ago, but it's important that you keep in mind the bacterium is still active in prairie dog colonies today here in northern Arizona. Especially, I know there is, is some research on the prairie dogs that are around Flagstaff uh, that through the season sort of have a cycling of plague uh, infections still today. Um, so it's not something that's gone away. There's still the potential there to be infected with it if you're hanging out in a prairie dog town, perhaps. Uh, anyway, then we'll move on to botulism, or Clostridium botulinum is the bacteria, bacterium that, ooh, that should say produces, not produxes, but anyway. Uh, your book mentioned it once, but I want to talk about it again, where what happens is this produces, this bacteria produces an exotoxin, so it secretes it into its environment that causes botulism. So this particular poison that the bacteria generates is a neurotoxin. And what it does is it diminishes your body's ability to generate um, a specific molecule, I cannot remember the name of it right now, that facilitates the transmission of signals in your nerves. Uh, so when your electrical impulses, your nerves can no longer perform communication. Uh, it's like going numb to death, if that makes sense. Uh, currently, botulism doesn't kill many people, probably because most people don't ingest enough of the toxin to create a huge effect, but if it does, it will kill you because it essentially destroys the signal from your brain to tell your lungs to continue breathing. Uh, so literally it turns off your body's circuitry. And yes, Botox is an extraction or a related version to the toxin that Clostridium botulinum produces. Uh, it was designed for therapeutic uses, although nowadays it's used for uh, cosmetic things. It will also uh, prevent you from sweating, so people will get uh, Botox injections in their armpits. Uh, but uh, for me, the idea that it's so closely tied to um, an incredibly potent poison is extremely an extremely uncomfortable idea to choose to have it injected into one's body. Anyway, these pictures, the one on the top, uh, on that guy's neck, that poor guy's neck, is uh, a picture of a lesion, an anthrax lesion. They look black, just straight black, uh, so that's dead skin as the anthrax infection takes hold and begins to grow. Now, uh, the bottom picture is botulism. I don't know the story behind this boy. Uh, I think what I read, I think he was 14 years old. Uh, I don't know if he survived, but he is fully conscious in this picture, but he cannot move anything because his nerves cannot communicate. So um, that's, I think, why you see the person holding his eyes open there on the um, second picture. So, gross, right? Moving on. What we're going to look at are the ecological ro roles of prokaryotes. 
And as I sort of mentioned before, it, uh, prokaryotes are absolutely critical in the soil uh, for decomposition. Um, part of ecology in the soil layers where you've got new organic matter accumulating on the top layer and as you dig into the soil the layers essentially the particles of the layers get smaller and smaller based on um, the processes that fungi and bacteria perform on those organic substances to break them down. Uh, water is obviously a key player as are plant roots in performing aeration and breaking things down. So initially that is the number one role prokaryotes play in the environment. Uh, secondarily, uh, they have a huge role in assisting animals in digestion. They assist fungi in digestion in the soil and they assist animals with digestion in your gut. So um, that's kind of cool. But now uh, people are trying to harness the ability of prokaryotes to uh, perform decomposition as a way to remove pollutants from the environment. And this is called bioremediation. This is a, a huge burgeoning field right now only because there is something called the um, Superfund Act or a Superfund site where money from I believe gasoline and oil sales is uh, a certain percentage is diverted to fund the cleanup of sites that are deemed to be extremely, extremely polluted and toxic with extremely harmful chemicals. Most of them are dioxins or uh, the chemicals used from dry cleaning agents or other petrochemicals uh, that in the 50s were just sort of wantonly dumped onto the ground or into pits and along creeks. Uh, so what people are trying to do or what has been done successfully so far is when there's an oil spill there are generally many bacteria already present in the environment that can break down oil and uh, petroleum products just naturally that's a part of their normal nutrient and energy gathering cycles or their metabolism uh, but now people are trying to look into genetically engineering microorganisms uh, for additional biological cleanup. And when I was at NAU, we spent a lot of time looking at this in a bioremediation course, bioremediation course that I took. And while it consistently comes down to a lovely idea, they have been able to develop extremely effective microorganisms uh, to break down some incredibly toxic chemicals. Uh, the idea of releasing these organisms into the environment without any I, any inclination or possibility of understanding the implications they will have on the living flora and fauna in an area is an unknown variable that is far too great to risk releasing some kind of unknown human-made bacteria into the environment and uh, one reason that is one reason that I found this field to be extremely appealing is uh, because uh, the people that are out there performing bioremediation will not just release something into the environment without knowing the consequences much unlike the rest of the corporations in the United States um, namely uh, fracking where they'll inject an unknown combination of liquids and chemicals into the ground without thinking about what's going to happen. Uh, the idea of releasing uh, genetically engineered microorganisms is extremely frightening and they won't do it and it I hope you understand why because <laughs> I could go on and on about it so I'm going to try not to. Um, so this was the best sort of photo to give you a visual of um, what people are trying to accomplish with bioremediation. Obviously in this before picture in the upper left it's an algal bloom and just so you know this is the result of the overuse of fertilizers in the environment uh, namely nitrogen and phosphorus because what that does is re relieves organisms in the water from what is commonly a limiting nutrient which would be phosphorus. Once that nutrient becomes abundant their populations explode. Uh, it feeds algae and uh, 
this is not the problem. The green stuff is not the problem in a closed system like this in a pond. The problem is when these algae die and they all sink to the bottom, the decomposers in the bottom of the ocean use all the free oxygen, or in the ocean, I'm sorry, in the bottom of the body of water, use most of the free oxygen that's available in the liquid, uh, thereby making it essentially an anaerobic environment, and all of the fish and other living things in the pond will die as a result of this algal bloom. Uh, I think you've probably seen how Willow Lake and Watson Lake endure blooms like this each summer, and it just baffles me how people are so open arms because they don't know what's happening. It's very simple. Any ecologist can tell you it's an overuse of fertilizers upstream. Every house, everybody who uses miracle grow soil um, applies fertilizer to their lawn. A very, very small amount of that fertilizer actually sticks into the soil where it's applied or is used by the plant to which it's been given. Most of it washes away and in these desert soils there isn't much that remains in the soil. It generally gets washed into the local bodies of water and creates these algal blooms. So anyway, um, bioremediation is an attempt here. This is a, a company as you can see in the um, uh, website at the bottom. They've produced an enzyme that you put into your local pond if this is your property uh, to reduce the algal blooms here. I um, did not look into exactly how it works but it's the idea of using sort of microorganisms to, and I'm going to say in quotation marks, clean up an environment. Now moving on to protists. Protists is a term for the highly variable and varied um, types of unicellular eukaryotes. Um, protist is not a term for prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are pretty much bacteria. Um, this picture here shows perhaps an amoeba, some diatoms, and many, oops, ah, <laughs> and many other forms of protists. Uh, and protists first appeared, as far as we know, in the fossil record about two billion years ago. And the reason they do appear in the fossil record is because, see this outline here, this shell? Uh, this is a diatome, and this shell is made of silica. That's like sand. That's what glass is made out of. That's what diatomaceous earth is. Uh, so diatome, diatomaceous earth. So anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about the protists. Before we do that, because we're making the shift from talking about bacteria to talking about more complex cells to eukaryotes, we need to spend a little time looking at the endosymbiotic theory. Now, I don't know if you remember, the endosymbiotic theory is something that's used to try to explain how mitochondria, or even a nucleus, or a chloroplast, became a part of a eukaryotic cell, basically making the definition of a eukaryotic cell, a cell, a bacterial cell with organelles. Um, one part is an idea that the folding of the membrane of something similar to a prokaryotic cell eventually enveloped the DNA to protect it or you know something that had a protective sort of layer around its DNA uh, provided a, an advantage. It, th somehow that gave it a way to say resist viruses in its environment and was then thereby able to reproduce more quickly than other cells it was competing against. Uh, th so that's potentially how a nucleus developed. Uh, then the other half of the endosymbiotic theory is perhaps that if you l think of a mitochondria as a bacterium, it may have developed a close relationship with a cell, uh, much like this one here where it had the beginning of a nucleus. Perhaps it lived just outside the cell and whatever chemicals that this mitochondria excreted, it would frequently exchange with this cell in terms of I don't know, some s form of communication or um, transmission of chemicals between them. And or perhaps uh, the cell with the nucleus tried to eat a mitochondria uh, but it never actually digested it 
and the mitochondrion's ability to generate energy uh, formed this incredibly strong symbiotic relationship. So each time this cell divided, the mitochondrion divided with it. Who knows? Sort of similarly with the chloroplast. It's an incorporation or potentially the next step after a very, very close symbiotic relationship. And in a way, I don't know if you guys remember me talking about our muscular mycorrhizal fungi on the first day of class, something I spent a little bit of time looking at. Um, I think that gives an excellent segue into understanding how a symbiotic relationship could very slowly and easily become a full-on symbiosis, uh, where one organism becomes fully incorporated into another and that new organism is something different entirely. Uh, so when looking at the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, remember the fungi generally exist on the exterior of the roots of plants. So the plant is one organism, the fungi is another. But the hyphae of the fungi, those very, very fine fingers that it has, were eventually able to, are able to penetrate the cell wall of a root cell. And then it develops a structure within that root cell. And within that structure is how the fungi and the plant exchange carbohydrates and other mineral substances. Uh, so they are ultimately connected, um, not just because they live right next to each other, but because their organismal, organismal structures are fully imbound, like the the fungi is enveloped by the cell in the root of the plant. And I use that mental imagery to maybe try to understand what happened here with the endosymbiotic theory and how a mitochondria and a chloroplast became incorporated into another cell producing a eukaryotic cell. So moving on, since we're talking about eukaryotes, uh, they have three main ways in terms of protists to garner nutrients. The first on the left there, the green one, is an autotroph, so obviously it's photosynthetic. The one in the middle is a heterotroph, so it eats other things, essentially. So troph is eat, auto is by itself, hetero is other, so that's an other eater. That's a, that particular picture shows a parasitic trypanosome, which looks really gross next to those blood cells. Um, and then finally C, a mixotroph, which would be a combination of each. Uh, in a particular environmental condition, it could be an autotroph, or if sunlight is unavailable to it, it could become a heterotroph. So in the realm of protists, there are four main types. Obviously the protozoans, slime molds, algae, and seaweeds. And if you've ever seen a slime mold, they are really, really cool looking. I would love to take a time-lapse photograph someday of a slime mold so you could uh, see how it moves. But anyway, the protozoans are typically the amoebas. This next word I had never sh is difficult for me. It's apicomplexans? and ciliates. So a ciliate is a protist that moves using its cilia. That's pretty simple. An amoeba, I'm sure you've seen a video of an amoeba where it just kind of crawls and creeps and pulls along and when it needs to eat something it just sort of absorbs it, like envelops it by its uh, cell wall. Uh, and then slime molds are similar, single-celled organisms which live generally as a colony. Uh, they often look like fungi and uh, perform a similar role as they are decomposers. Then algae, uh, I know you're familiar with algae, we've all seen them before. These are photosynthetic protists. There are three main realms where there are the, I think it's dinoflagellates, I'm not sure if it's dinoflagellates, I'm pretty sure it's dino. The diatoms like I've showed you and green algae. Then finally there are seaweeds which are multicellular marine algae. So I guess it's a sort of a subgroup of algae except that it's multicellular. Now looking at the protozoans, many of them are parasitic, uh, especially Giardia here. Hopefully you've never come across that, but it's got the flagella which propel it through its environment. Trichomonas is another version of it. And this is a pretty interesting picture of an amoeba. Uh, and you can imagine how they just sort of creep and crawl along. 
a 4M, an apicomplexin, and a cilia. You see the cilia, uh, it moves here, and the cilia can also be used to bring food items closer to the individual so it may absorb them and essentially eat them. Then we'll move on to a slime mold. They have cells which are amoeba-like, uh, perhaps explaining how once you get enough of them together, they can literally move like this. It looks like it's walking and heading that direction, sort of like a slug. Probably leaves a slimy trail too. You. And uh, they do also make reproductive structures, much like fungi, where this would be a mushroom. Uh, or it kind of looks like a spore. Uh, but that's a way for them to uh, reproduce, and I'm not sure I sh well, for them to reproduce. And then finally, looking at diatoms. These are amazing, intricate little creatures. The dinoflagellate, it's got a flagella so it can move, but it's uh, got a very intricate sort of protective plate design. And then diatoms, or diatomes, I've heard it said both ways, they are beautiful under the microscope. They're glassy and rainbowy uh, because of the way the light reflects across their bodies. Uh, this is silica, and there are fossil layers uh, where it is mined, and you can buy diatomaceous earth, uh, like at the garden store. And uh, I remember we would use that in the greenhouse. We'd sprinkle it on the, the shelves because we had a grasshopper problem. And what it essentially does, it's ground up diatome shells, so it's super sharp. And it basically slices the exoskeleton of an insect up and they leak out. So then down here, the green algae has a pair of flagella that you can see. So that's algae. And then Volvox is a colonial sort of green algae here. It lives in colonies. And finally, of the protists, there are seaweeds. And these are large. You don't need a microscope to see them. They are identified by the color that, well, the <laughs> what color they look like, essentially. So there is green, red, and brown. So obviously these are much larger structures. They are multicellular, cellular, but they're still identified under the grouping of protists. Now the idea of some of these protists living in colonies, um, or even, yeah, basically the protists living in colonies, it can occur where one section of the colony w may consistently perform a function that will cause them to become more and more specialized. Say uh, the cells up here, say they're photosynthetic, become, or down here, photosynthetic, uh, become more and more capable of performing so photosynthesis as they divide. Um, because that is primarily what they end up doing, and they transfer food to the other members of their colony. But then these members end up growing lar longer and longer flagellum through their generations because their role becomes more important in assisting the colony in, say, moving through a pond. So eventually, over time, as sort of individual evolution and natural selection occurs on each end of the colony, these cells become more and more specialized and interdependent. What ha may happen is that as the specialization continues, some of these cells will become more uh, designed or become more effective in producing gametes. Uh, just simply their role becomes reproduction and then the role of the other individuals in the colony becomes more as that of somatic cells in a body. So this is a very simple sort of way that you can see how a group of individuals could become one. Now for a brief recap, we looked at evolution in terms of millions of years. So if Earth started for, <laughs> well, 4,000 million years ago, so um, we're looking at about 4 billion years, almost 5. Uh, the first prokaryotic fossils were noticed about 3.5 billion years ago. Oxygen appeared 2.4 billion years ago. Eukaryotic fossils appeared 1.8 billion years ago. 
multicellular organisms, which we just discussed, which are fairly recent, 1.2 billion years ago, and then animal, animals and plants and fungi only half a million years ago. So this process has occurred rather quickly. And this is a general phylogenetic tree showing whatever our common ancestor was, branching off into bacteria, and then from there we've got archaea and eukarya, and from eukarya this encompasses all the families of protists, plants, fungi, and animals, which is the world in which we are fully, fully engaged. So, I hope that helps.